Hey everybody, Raul here for Bass Musician Magazine, and today we have the great honor and pleasure of chatting with Paul Gray. Many of you might recognize Hello. Paul from The Damned, Eddie and the Hot Rods, Professor and the Madman, Sensible Gray Cells, and many, many, many acts in addition to this. But more importantly, we always like to go to the past. Paul, how did you get started in music and on bass? Oh, how long have you got? <laughs> We have all well, the time you need. Well, my mum, before I came along and ruined it all for her, was uh, a professional musician. She was an uh, associate at the Royal College of Music in London. And she had a really lovely contralto voice that used to embarrass me when I got hauled along the church, you know, when I was eight years old. Mm -hmm. But she was a great pianist. We had a baby grand piano, which I've got downstairs now. And she could kind of, she could sight read Rachmaninoff. Wow. But if you, she couldn't improvise. If you asked her to improvise anything, she'd be totally lost. And I was always kind of, not that I actually liked Rachmaninoff back then mm. when I was 10, but I was kind of in, in awe of her reading all these like squiggly little dots on the page. I got up to grab grade three or four on the piano and I, I just got too tedious. And she was always kind of like, wondering how I managed to just hear stuff and kind of make it up. So as soon as I heard, I suppose it was it was T-Rex, I think, probably right away, right away Swan. When was that? 68, 69? Mm -hmm. I'd have been about 10 years old. And they're on a program called Top of the Pops. And it was the bass player that kind of got my attention yeah. because... Bass players always seem to look the coolest people in bands, don't they? Yeah. And even then, I, I think he had the longest kind of hair and the longest neck on the, you know, <laughs> on the guitar and those big kind of shiny machine heads. Yeah. He's playing this thing and it was like, this is another world, man. This is like crazy stuff. So that kind of, I think, really kicked me off into discovering the, the wacky world of, you know, electric guitars. I didn't know electric guitar, did I thought, you know, if, if you plugged a wire into it and plugged it into the electric socket and turned it on, <laughs> it would make it louder. I mean, seriously, I did. And when I got my first guitar, my dad, I based him for about a year, two years after, and it was 10 pounds, called a Rosetti, semi-acoustic job, and it was, kind of unplayable because the strings are about an inch off the fingerboard. Oh. But I didn't know it. I, I had no idea what it was meant. I couldn't tune it, didn't know how you tuned the bass. And it had a didn't have a jack plug. It had two wires soldered to one of the knobs. And then just two bare wires at the end. Weird, huh? And I thought if I put an electric plug on that and plugged it in there, that would make it electric and <laughs> Honestly, I did. Look, good job I never did it. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here today. But the B side of Rider White Swamp was a song called Is It Love? That's it, Is It Love? And about a year later, I found out it was just two notes, E and A. But I didn't know really how to tune a bass. There was no bass guitar books then, mm -hmm. you know, no videos or anything like that. So I just kind of had the strings really floppy without having tuned to anything. And I got all the poses right in front of the bedroom mirror with it before I actually learned to play a note on it. But yeah, it just went from there, all the glam rock stuff, you know, sw uh, sweet uh, Slade, fantastic bass player in Slade, Jimmy Lee. And of course, you know, my, my friends at school introduced me to early Black Sabbath and Deep Purple and Zeppelin, all the usual stuff. Mm -hmm. And tonight I discovered John Entwistle. And Lemmy, those two guys kind of came along at the same time, and, and that was the epiphany, that yeah. was right. So getting the job driving a bus or working in a bank, you know, that's that's what I'd really like to do. And, you know, lucky enough, I got to do it. Excellent. And are you pretty much self-taught? Totally self-taught, yeah. I've got no idea about technique, you know, <laughs> if... If I went along to have a guitar exam, I'd fail miserably. Mm -hmm. You know, I, 
I, I hold the base because nobody told me how, you know, you're meant to pivot your finger and all that malarkey, you know, free position. I only found out about 10 years ago. <laughs> and I just, I just love holding it and playing it. You know, I, I was Johnny No Mates. So I came out from school, mm-hmm. shut the bedroom door, put on my Hawkman records and, and just figured out where the notes are. But the learning the piano to, you know, grade four gave me a grounding in, in harmony, mm-hmm. you know, without me realizing too much. Because, you know, to be honest, I found a bit of a chore practicing half an hour in a freezing cold room every day. Music, I didn't really like, I like bits of Bach, and of course I love Bach now. Yeah. But it was always the bottom end of the keyboard that held the most allure to me. You've heard this before, haven't you? Oh, totally. But carry on. Yeah. <laughs> but that's, you know, that's what us bass players kind of, we hone into that. And so I started, you know, figuring out, oh, if I do that, that, you know, C, E, and G, where, where's that on the, on, the, on the bass? And I kind of figured it out from there. And... I, I didn't I didn't learn any scales on the bass because to me that was boring. That's what you had to learn for classical music on the piano. Sure. So I thought I'm having none of that. You know, I'm, I'm going to be like Levy. I'm going to look as cool as I can. I want one of those man-looking guitars that he's got one day. And uh, that that was kind of it. So yeah, totally self-taught. You know, I hold the bass like a cricket bat which apparently you're not meant to do. Okay. <laughs> you know, I've got my thumb over the thing. But, you know, look at Hendrix. He's got his thumb over the thing. Paul, Paul Kossoff. Mm-hmm. All, all the kind of guitarists that I like haven't got, I don't think, you know, the way that you're supposed to play if you're taught, you know, properly. So I kind of learn improperly. And the weird thing is, is that I'm fairly convinced that had I had lessons, and there were no bass guitar teachers back in 1972, mm-hmm. you know, there were no, but, you know, spin forward 20, 30 years later, I think if I'd have had bass guitar lessons, I wouldn't play the way that I play. And so consequently, you know, if you take that back, I probably wouldn't have been in the bands and had the career that I've got because I'd have played more conventionally, mm-hmm. certainly more accurately, but because I'm kind of, I'm a bit inaccurate, I just totally play from feel, you know, it's absolutely instant, and if it's wrong, it's, it's wrong, but happily most of the time it's right, and yeah. I don't worry about making notes, it doesn't bother me in, in, in making more notes, it doesn't bother me in the slightest, because you can always get out of it somehow. Mm-hmm. So I think it's that spirit, that probably got me the, the gigs and the bands that I've been lucky enough to have. And perhaps, you know, had I been uh, not self-taught and maybe learned from well, YouTube videos today or something, I, I may not play the, the way that I would have done. And so I wouldn't have had the, the style that I've got, if you can call it a style. I don't know. Well, certainly. And the, the interesting thing is, I think that kind of depending on the demands that you have. If you would have been trying to play in a symphony, if you would have been doing uh, Broadway shows, if you would have been doing these things, then the technique and the ability to sight read and all these things would have been critical. Crucial, yeah. However, with a lot of rock, it so much of it is intuitive and making choices and and I totally agree I I played with the group for a while we had a piano player who was classically trained we were playing jazz and he couldn't improvise and and, and it was we we said okay take take a solo and he'd freeze like a deer in the headlights and then the next time he came back he had written out he had pre arranged and made up a solo and we're like, well, that's not improvised, but go ahead. You can play that thing when it's your turn. So, I mean, yeah. you know, there's different demands. So when, when it comes to the groups that you're playing with, again, tell us a little bit about that progression because I've kind of seen uh, a, a recurring theme. You've worked back and forth with a lot of some of the same musicians, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Well, the, f- the first band, I mean, I, I was really lucky to join um, – the first band I was in at, you know, Hot Rods, kind of by chance, I went out 
to wrote in the summer holidays from school and bought the local paper for no reason. I'd never bought it before and I've never actually bought it again. But, you know, something impelled me to buy the paper. And in the back of it, there was just one ad under music and it said bass guitarist wanted called Camp the Island. So it was kind of, what do you call it, serendipity maybe? Mm -hmm. So it took me about a day to summon up the courage to pick the phone up and call it. Because I spent, you know, I, I played with some friends at school, but, you know, nothing serious. So I thought maybe, maybe I can get in the group now, you know, maybe we can have some practices somewhere and it will help me get a bit better. Mm -hmm. So I called up and the bloke just said, can you play fast? <laughs> um, that was it. Can you play fast? So I said, no idea. I said, yeah, I think I can play fast. He said, oh, well, we're called Eddie and the Hot Rods. Come over to Feel Good House tomorrow on Canvey. And this was 75, and there was a band called Dr. Feel Good. Mm. And they were kind of blowing all the, the big kind of maybe, you know, your, your stadium rock bands. They were getting on the front page of the magazines because they were kind of really raw, animalistic, rhythm and blues, rock and roll, taking it right back to the roots, you know, mm -hmm. kind of the garage stuff from, from the 60s. And they were local heroes, but they were kind of national heroes by then. So I went to audition in their studio, which was like... <laughs> and I had this three-quarter size Columbus Fender copy bass guitar in a cardboard box. And my dad drove me down there and there was three or five of the bass players went to the audition who had, you know, tweed cases with fender on and shiny jazz bases. And I thought, oh, why am I even here? You know, look at the, no contest, you know, I just wanted the sort of ground to open up and swallow me. But I was the last, last guy to go in and I was a bit younger than the rest of the guys, certainly the most inexperienced, because I could hear what they were playing through the wall. And I thought, oh, God, I don't play anything like that. You know, it was really rhythm and blues stuff, very kind of, you know, precise bass lines, if you like. And I learned from trying to copy John Entwist or Lemmy, which is kind of, you know what that's like. Mm -hmm. So I thought, there's no way this is going to fit in. So I thought, right, going to go in three minutes, jump about, shake the hair about, play everything I can and bugger off and that'll be it, you know. And they, they said, the end of it, they looked at each other and said, yeah, it's great. Yeah, sounds good. Got the job. And I think it was, again, that, that spirit and kind of joie de vivre and not worrying too much about just having a great time. Mm -hmm. And then it one guitarist, and he played a Telecaster, very fast band. So because there was no lead guitarist, it kind of gave me a lot of leeway what to play on the bass. And nobody ever told me you're playing too much or you should leave some space there because there was no space to hot rides it was all 100 miles an hour <laughs> so i kind of had the time of my life and i kind of continued that way ever since and it kind of stood me in good stead because you know i when he was playing a power chords if you like mm -hmm. you know i figured out what well, if i play a frat below that note which I later find out would be like a minor third rather than a major third, mm -hmm. that really changed the sound of it. Totally. And because I had no kind of real, you know, musical theory apart from learning classical music, none of it was really explained to me. It was just, you've got to learn this and the fingers have got to be in that position on the keyboard. It was kind of a revelation. I thought, I can be really subversive here and change, totally change the feel of the songs. And I took me a little while to figure out how it was and what it was. So, yeah, I mean, I, I spent five years with them. And along the way, did stuff with Johnny Thunders and Rob Tyler Blessing from the MC5, both which were kind of huge, you know, influences on me. And uh, then ended up with The Damned, you know, in 1980. And then from then to UFO, which is a bit of a weird mix going from a band that, you know, people naturally think is a punk band to a hard rock band. Mm -hmm. But I played exactly the same. I didn't change my approach by so same three or four chords. Yeah. You know, just a bit slower or faster with a different top line over it. It, it sounds with the influence, when you're creating your bass lines, 
are you consciously thinking about like Ent Whistle or Lemmy, or do you go? Is it just more random, kind of? I don't think about anything. <laughs> it it just you know if pe people ask me you know they come backstage and say hey Paul how should you play that bit there I've really got to think about it because <laughs> I don't know it's. I, ne I never practice. I've never practiced in my life. I I'll sit and play along to songs, but I've never sat down and practiced all that mode stuff and all the triads and mm -hmm. boring, you know, but get real life stuff. That's what interests me. Stuff that, you know, relates to the music that I'm hearing. I'm not good if, if of making up bass stuff by myself. That doesn't interest me. What interests me is hearing what somebody else has done on a keyboard or on a guitar without the bass and thinking, right, how can I, you know, fit all, gel all these bits together mm -hmm. and kind of keep keep the rhythm going, but add to it melodically. And I love melody, you know, I, I love pop songs, I love other, um, I love the monkeys, you know, I love cheesy pop, yeah. especially 60s pop. And it was chock full of melodies. And so many of those melodies came from the bass. There's a band called Love Affair. I don't know whether you're aware of them, but they're a um, quite well-known pop group in the late 60s over here. And these wonderful kind of galloping bass lines that totally drive the song rhythmically and melodically. A bit like Slade's bass lines. You know, if you listen to Slade's songs, mm -hmm. those fantastic... Uh, fantastic live album the things they did very much driven by the bass and i love all that dusty end stuff you know going up up the top and kind of playing off playing off a single lot because i terrible singer I, yeah. I can't sing for toffee so i hear all these vocal melodies in my head and harmony melodies to the main vocal line mm -hmm. and i think that's kind of what i tend to pick out in the bass how, how can I put, play this in the bass? So it's a kind of mixture of that and, you know, making sure that the rhythm's pretty much there, hopefully as well. So it, it's a bit of a mismatch. You know, I don't know how other bass players do it, but Entwist, that Live at Leeds album, was just the one that I still hold up as probably my favourite album of the last 50 years, you know. I, I'll always play that. and always listen to it and my jaw will just drop every time <laughs> excellent well and it's a good time to talk a little bit about how you're getting your specific sound as far as gear goes now i can't help but to see the rickenbackers behind you but tell us more about your gear what are you playing on i'll play on anything <laughs> doesn't bother me hugely i can kind of get the sound i want out of pretty much everything but Rickenback is always, you know, it, it was the usual suspects. You know, it was Chris Squire, mm -hmm. Roger Glove when he was use, using one, Lemmy, a guy called Gary Giles, and a band called Stray. They all used Rickenbackers, and I just love the shape of them. Not many people use them, even less use them these days, I think. And they just attracted me more than the Fender, because everybody played Fenders, and to me, this is sacrilege to probably 90% of your viewers, but <laughs> they're a bit like Magnolia paint. They kind of didn't really, apart from Entwistle, of course, you know, that like mm -hmm. bleeds out. But Rick's just kind of, they just look quite evil and mad. <laughs> and aesthetically, I was I was drawn to them. And I that percussive sound that they, they got as well. And I've been playing them, uh, apart from the Thunderbird, I've got a nice old Bicentennial Thunderbird here. But I've pretty made, much played Ricks, well, I have played Ricks for the last 46 years. And I've got a nice bunch of them now. But amp-wise, um, with the Dan now, I use an old V4 or an old V4B with a tatty old 8x10. It's not mine, it belongs to our guitar tech. I know hardly anything about amps. If I plug it in and kind of I can probably get a sound after about 30 seconds that I'm happy with. I'm not overly fussy. Mm -hmm. A lot of it comes from the pick, 
you know, and your fingers, and sure. obviously, you know, where you, where you place it. So, amps, yeah, I, I'm I'm not a huge kind of uh, tech head with amps. I I just finished a new damned album, and I use the thing. I don't use pedals really. This thing here, a bass butler. Okay. Yes. Band, and it, it's nice. It splits the signal, so you can have a, a warm bottom end and it splits into a sort of simulated tiny little crappy guitar and um, so you get a nice bit of dirt you can dial in the dirt on the top end which seems to rip really nicely but yeah like like this yeah peg but out front i go into a dunk pinnock uh tech 21 mm -hmm. and that goes straight into the inner monitors goes into another sam's amp without any dirt on it and they both go out front so our out front guy's got the clean bottom end and he's got again the grip from the the Doug Pennick Tech 21 which suits the ricks really nicely but I'll probably use this when we go out hopefully next year but Sun Coliseum was my favorite the old transistor Sun amps mm -hmm, you remember mm -hmm. them yeah they're all around it in the late 70s so used to hire them when we, when we toured America. And I used to borrow a couple of um, end whistles because we used to rehearse at their rehearsal place. I'm an executive up in Shepparton. And I used just one of these Sun Coliseums and two 412s, and that was just stupendous. I mean, the racket that made. Mm -hmm. He had like about six of the buggers, you know. And I just used various stuff. Marshalls, I tend to blow them up a bit. Yeah. Um, Lane, I used for a while, but. You know, a nice old Ampeg, I don't think you can beat that, you know, especially with the Thunderbird and the Rick. I agree. And because you use your fingers and your hands so much to get your sound, do you have a preference in strings? Yes. Rotor sound always. Okay. And I have a, a, a light gauge I use, I think, 40 to, 45 to 90. Very light. So I've got very, very light bottom end. But I like that because the, it tends to have a little bit more grit. I, I'm not one for sort of woolly, thumpy bass sounds. I, I like them to be quite nasty and, <laughs> you know, present. So I dabble with Picanto strings for a bit. You know, I've tried the really expensive top end ones. I always go back row sound and I've used them pretty much exclusively since 76, 77. Very um, nice. And, and they're great with a, with a rig, they, they work. Yeah. Just the, the stainless steel, you know, box standard stainless steel, but um, pretty light gauge, yeah. And these big old um, medium Gibson picks. There you go. Excellent, excellent. Well, and looking ahead, I know we're kind of on the tail end of the pandemic here, although we've had a big resurgence that's affected a lot of plans for the future. But what plans do you have for the future, if, if you know of any? Yeah. Well, we were supposed to be out in, well, we are supposed to be doing a world tour last year. Obviously, that didn't happen. We're supposed to be doing it this year. That didn't happen. So we've just finished doing a new Damned album. Mm -hmm. And we're still tiny up little bits doing that remotely. So where the latest is that we're heading out, starting off in California in May. And then we're going out with a very big well-known American band that I can't mention yet okay. um, because it's the, the dates haven't been totally confirmed but um, I think we're, we're going to be kind of ping-ponging bouts and forwards to America next year and then there'll be a world tour hopefully touch wood after that to time with the new album um, I'll be doing some more stuff with the Professor Madman guys, mm -hmm. um, two guys, uh, fantastic musicians from California, and rap the old damn jammer. I do all that remotely uh, from here. That that's that's great fun. Uh, they use really, they love the Beatles, and they use really weird kind of Beatlesy chords that are. It's like a nasty Beatles with, with a kind of dark edge to it, and they, their songs are great for my bass lines because they leave me so much leeway in any one of those songs there's about 10 different lines i could play 
So I normally send them eight or ten different <laughs> passes. I, I can't decide. You guys can decide which one to use. Pick the one. And I've got a new project as well with some other pretty well-known musicians. Again, I can't unfortunately tell you about that quite yet as well. And I'm doing some remote stuff. I set up a, a website, Paul Great Bass Online, last year because nothing was happening. Mm -hmm. I thought I'd try and get some session work, and that's been really good. So people send me in, you know, songs to play bass on, and I knock them out here, and um, that's that's great fun as well. So lot lot of time to make up. It sounds like yeah. there's a lot of things in the works, and if people want to kind of stay on top of this, because they're they're going to want to kind of revisit to find out where you are. Where's the best place to look? You mentioned Paul Gray Bass Online. Paul Gray Bass Online uh, dot com. Okay. And Paul Gray Bass Online on Facebook. Those are my two kind of uh, main ones. Yeah. Excellent. And, and the damn site, but but that's never updated, so forget about that. One. <laughs> well, that that is a a common malady with many musicians and bands is if they're yeah, busy right. playing. Their their website is behind, and you know it takes somebody. If it's a full time job for someone, yeah, and it is. unfortunately, if it's a band member, then it doesn't happen. But <laughs> so, Paul, we do appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to chat with us and share your story and your history, folks. Make sure you stay on top of what Paul's doing. You've seen him here, Paul Gray on Bass Musician Magazine. Love to speak to you. Thanks very much. Thank you.